why? Why? Like, why are you here? Welcome, everyone, to this edition of Fish Stripes Live. We are here in a new air for the Miami Marlins. This is a brand new episode after we had our Fish Stripes Jeopardy. Uh, as you can see, we have some familiar faces, some new faces, and some returning faces. First off, we have Noah Berger, Isaac, Eli, Grant coming back for the first time in what it feels like six months, and joining us for our first time guest. You might know him on Twitter as Jay-Z in the house. It is Jorge Alvarado. George, it's great to have you on, and I'm still salty about you beating me in Marlins Twitter uh, March Madness. What's up, fellas? Happy to be here. Uh, the first thing I want to talk to everyone about, I think, is the gigantic elephant in the room, and that is the new Marlins manager, Skip Schumacher. Uh, coming in. Uh, former player, I believe, played how long? Uh, 10, 8 seasons? 11, 11, 11 seasons, okay. mostly with the Cardinals, a little bit with the Dodgers. He finished up with the Reds, last played in uh, 2015. And now, obviously, a first-time manager. He's interviewed a few times, and um, now he's here. It's officially official. Yeah, uh, going into that, uh, let's start with Grant. I haven't heard from Grant in a long time. Give me your what's your thoughts on our on Skip being the Skip. Um, thanks for welcoming me back. Um, college life is busy, but anyways, so very happy about it. Um, he, he's very young. I, mean, I was watching him with the Reds not that long ago, literally seven years ago. He was with the team, so it's good to have such a young guy. We talked about that a lot. Preached that we wanted someone who can kind of relate to the players and familiarize himself himself with those guys and. Um, I think they have someone good for that role. The only knock, as Eli mentioned in yesterday's spaces, is no bilingual um, aspect to that. But other than that, excellent hiring, um, recent managing or coaching success, I should say, uh, Padres, Cardinals, two winning organizations as of late. So I think bringing in some of that winning culture and some of that winning touch uh, should definitely help this Marlins clubhouse that uh, was a little bit rocky last year. I think that he could be the guy to right the ship. And uh, it's a good first domino for what's hopefully uh, a good off season. Yeah. Um, Isaac, same question to you. I feel like I want to get everyone's opinion on this because, you know, if this is the news we've been waiting for for the Marlins, and a little surprising just how early it's happening with other managerial op- jobs still open. Um, what, what are your thoughts to Skip? What do you think he brings to the Marlins maybe that other teams or other managers maybe might not have had? Well, you know what? They got their guy. I think they got a guy that, you know, obviously played Major League Baseball and was pretty successful at it and was that type of player, that utility role type player that I think would always transition well into the managerial role. And I think something important, like you guys mentioned, not bilingual, not from South Florida, but he is someone that seems to have that competitive edgeness that we read in the Herald today. Also, just the fact that he's sort of analytically driven in addition to that. So I think just the whole combination, the whole package is great. I think Eli mentioned it on Fish Stripes article how, like, it would be the holy trifecta if they were able to get – Joe Espada as a bench coach as well. We'll see where, where he ends up. But obviously, I give this this hiring an A+. Plus and I can't wait till spring training. Can you imagine that? He, he leaves the Astros to take the same position with the Marlins, probably for less money. Looking up to <laughs> Instead of looking up to Dusty Baker, looking up to a guy 30 years younger than him. Uh, that, was, that was a joke that I put out there. Um, that, that is the thing that is in my mind and in a lot of people's mind because, I mean, to be fair – Obviously, there's excitement about there finally being a guy in that position. So the vibe is positive. But going into this, the clear majority of people wanted Joe Espada among the finalists compared to Schumacher and compared to who are the other finalists? Uh, Luis Rojas and Matt Quattraro. Like, Espada was the guy that the most people wanted that checked all the boxes. And, uh, well, it's still uncertain whether he's going to get a job in this cycle, which seems kind of unthinkable that he's been – there with the Astros going to ALCS after ALCS every single year for the last half decade in the bench coach role. So we'll see whether he gets that gig with the White Sox or the Royals or if the unthinkable happens and he sticks around. But in my mind, it'd be hard to understand how Skip got the job over him, all things being created equal. 
Uh, so I want to see how that plays out over the next what, week or so and see where he lands in all this as well. Yeah, what was reported was that he blew the Marlins away in the interview process. And obviously, you can't really gauge how good someone's going to be at managing through an interview. But he must have really impressed them a lot in those two interviews that he had with Kim Ng. And I'm sure Bruce Sherman was probably in there as well. But he, I think that was something that was really clear that he really wowed them in, the, in that process. Yeah. And this yeah. is the full press release for uh, people that haven't uh, read it yet. Where this is, I guess, the top part of it with uh, just the highest possible praise he could get from Bruce Sherman and from Kim. And he's, they wrote all the right things. And I think in most people's minds, the bigger tell will be what it sounds like coming out of their mouths at the press conference, which we expect to be sometime next week. Yeah. So not imminent. They have a while to prepare exactly how they're going to handle all those questions and about the outlook of the team. But this is a press release for just anybody that hasn't seen it. Could that press conference possibly include the rest of the coaching staff and that behind the podium? Well, we, we expect potentially no some lengths to be decided by them. What is it, Noah? There's no reason why it couldn't include all of them. And honestly, it would kind of make sense why they're waiting uh, a week to do the press conferences, to, to give them time and to save the, the, the time and effort of, of everybody that has to be at the press conference. Um, it just it would be easier on everyone to just get everything done at once. And Maybe that's just introducing the whole. If they're introducing Skip and the entire coaching staff all at once, that's one. That's one trip to to the ballpark for everyone for the press conference. That yeah. makes things a lot easier. Um, I will say I do absolutely love the signing, uh, the hiring. Um, I'm interested to see what his contract will be, how long they give him. Um, but I think it'll be I, I I don't think it'll be very short. I think they're gonna give him some time, um, and I hope he does well um, for the sake of the team and the sake of my sanity. Um, and I'm excited, uh, and I can't wait to meet him. <laughs> yeah, this, this sort of reminds me of the Mike Redmond hiring, where they I think they do want someone young with these young group of guys, and I think that they're gonna give him a long time, like you said. No, I think. Like you said, <laughs> it's, no. it's, base two years and then we'll see where they go from there like mike red yeah 20 is he the first manager to have played in the stat cast era that's a good question now that i think about it he probably is so that would mean guys who played in the majors in 2015 uh -huh. or later um because kevin cash was i think just missed that yeah and um even though there are a couple of younger managers out there they did, were not so closely connected to being major leaguers but that is you know it's kind of an arbitrary but, but let's so, go to jorge so wait, well who are you kind of rooting for in this when it was coming down to the final days i mean, i was with the general consensus i was i wanted to spot on like just check every box um but i'm not so mad at the uh i'm not so upset with the uh schumacher signing uh i think I, i've turned into like the biggest skeptic of every single Marlins anything, like in the second half of the season. It's like the name, as soon as Quattaro's name came up, I'm like, oh, this is, I put my conspiracy hat on, and I was like, this is shaping up for we're not doing anything, we're playing money ball, let's go. And so I uh, wanted to spot the, that tweet from, that tweet came out, kind of bummed out about it, but I, I'm not mad about it, I'm not mad about it. Uh, you get a young guy who's played, um, like Isaac said, he's, he's a utility player. So he's kind of played a little bit of everywhere. Uh, and a guy with fire, I got tired of seeing Donnie just kind of stand by, uh, Skip looks like a guy that will come out and just MF whoever needs it and light that fire. So I'm excited it, you know, give, give him a shot, see how he does. And I mean, right now it can't get much worse. Well, it could get worse. Uh, we'll see. Um, I don't disagree uh, that a spot. I checked a lot of boxes, Jorge. But let me, let me just ask a question. Um, what what boxes did a spot a check that Skip Schumacher does not? And I know one of them is the bilingual thing, which I mentioned this on Spaces yesterday. I think it's a little overblown. Um, honestly, like I, I get where it's coming from in the census of, in the sense I should say that you know a bilingual manager could connect a bit more with the fan base and connect more with the players on their level. But Don Mattingly wasn't bilingual and he was here for seven years and he was well-respected by 
by Hispanic players that that don't necessarily speak English as their first language. So, like, my my question here is: other than that, what are what are the boxes that that Joe would have checked for you that Skip does not? Other than that one. Well, Tori, you want to go ahead? I was just gonna say, like that. To me, that's just it's a big one. It's not a um, obviously, it's not a deal breaker, right? But I think there's something to be said to be able to connect with with players on with their primary language. Um, being somebody that's bilingual, um, and I've I've dealt with a lot of the, like the general public. Uh, I've de- you know I've coached as well before. Like there's just a certain comfort level to being able to communicate in in your first language. Um, and it's not that, you know, Skip's going to be respected any less. Uh, it's just that being able to put your players in, in a comfort zone um, by being able to communicate with their language, like that's, to, to me, that's a pretty big deal. It's, it's not a deal breaker, obviously, um, but it's a pretty big deal. Um, the other thing for me that kind of stuck out, even though, you know, Skip was with the Padres and, and with the Cardinals, and thankfully they come from like winning organizations. Um, but there's something to be said from being able to pull, pull personnel from the Astros organization. That's just like consistently, consistently just finishing, you know, 90 to 100 plus wins every year. And every year it's like, oh, well, they lost Correa. They're not, you know, they lost Springer and like they just turn out prospects and like the guys come up and they hit and it's like, Oh, this guy is like no name guys all of a sudden hitting like um, just being able to pull personnel from an organization. That's just like consistently up top is, was just kind of like the cherry on top. Yeah. Uh, the one thing I, I sort of agree with Alex in the sense that I don't think the bilingual thing is that big of a deal. Obviously it would help, but I don't see it being a deal breaker. Like you mentioned, Jorge. but I think the one thing, the one box that, Skip did it was that a spot actually does have managerial experience in the winter leagues. He does have some sort of experience managing and as opposed to Skip who doesn't at all. But I think other than that, that's gotta be the only thing that, you know, Skip doesn't have. So I think well, it well, should be noted that I think all the finalists at the very least were managers in the minors or the winter leagues right. and Skip didn't do any of that. Right. Like as soon as he was done playing in spring of 2016, the Padres cut him, but they said, you know, you're not a good player, but maybe you could work for us because you're like in the area anyway. And he learned the game that way, but he never, re- when it was just a couple of years after that, that he moved into the major league staff and he never, you know, led the team with the exception. I put the clip up earlier. He was, um, because he was the bench coach this last year, he did a few games filling in for their normal manager, Oliver that Marmol, counts. when he was ejected, when he had the flu, like early in the season, almost as soon as the season started, Marmol had the flu. And so almost immediately to start this year, Skip was doing some fill in games, but like very, very limited taste of, you know, what it takes to, um, to do that job. I did want to mention this. I think a lot of people noticed from Keith Law about uh, how he <laughs> and uh, some others did. Um, it was mostly just him about the fact Terrible. that pointing out that Skip um, just making it about race, like Terrible. immediately the fact that him compared to Rojas and in a spot of both being Hispanic and the fact that Schumacher got it despite not being a manager before um, with this being a decision that was made by, you know, the Can't only man. Asian woman right. Right. <laughs> that's like works completely in forgot about that part. Just didn't yeah. even mention it. It, it. it was horrible. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Somebody that you would expect to be <laughs> as sensitive as possible to like these biases that we might have subconsciously towards that. I, I don't think that was in play here. Um, that these guys, you know, they're in very similar stages of their careers, and even though there are these differences, you know, um, without being in the interviews our, on our own, you know, it's hard to really like be to feel too strongly one way or the other because we weren't in the room right there so but this is what they comes out with um again i i'm just curious to see what happens with those other guys whether they get some of the other jobs uh remaining that are still out there um and it, it was just exciting that they they were thorough in this process but they also move quickly and the fact yeah. that they did uh, announce it as quickly as they did i thought they were going to wait a few days longer than they actually did to put it out there um but they so they put in a lot of effort and maybe they get it wrong, but at least it's not for a lack of trying. I think I think uh, that that we is what we hope permeates through the rest of the offseason. Like, yeah, this was a big decision to make and they made it pretty quickly and they hired the guy that they wanted pretty quickly. So we, we hope that that permeates when it comes to players as well. 
Um, you know, we heard Kim say they can't afford to sit on their hands. And I think this is the start of that. So I think, you know, this is, as you see on the screen, it was a, a, an arduous long process. It wasn't just done overnight, but they got it done pretty quickly. They recognized their guy and they got him on paper pretty quickly. Right. Which I think is important. Um, and something that we hope permeates, not just the coaching, but the players in the off season. So we'll see what happens with that. One thing I wanted to call out Eli though, is a box that skip checks that Espada does not is that Skip Schumacher played in Major League Baseball. And Joe Espada did not. He played in the International Leagues and he played in Minor League Baseball. Wasn't very good, but he was okay. Wasn't very good. But Skip Schumacher played in Major League Baseball and he won two World Series championships. And that's not something that Joe Espada did. And this is a guy that knows the winning culture, knows what it takes to win a World Series in Major League Baseball. Not that Espada doesn't as a manager and as a coach, but he did not do it as a player. So, you know... Everything together, this is a guy, and you mentioned this yesterday on the spaces as well, Eli, who knows what it's like to go through the grind. He knows what it's like to be sent up and down like a couple of our minor league players have, knows what it's like to taste failure and then succeed. So I think everything together, coming coming from somebody like him that knows what it's like to go through things like that as a player to, to ultimately become a winner two times, ultimate winner two times, that's a kind of culture that you want to promote here, especially for such a young organization. So that is a really good thing to have that he has that a spot did not have as a player. So I think it's important. Very good. Yeah. Point. Uh, my question to you guys is, do you think this affects the way they go about um, free agency, the off season in terms of picking up new players, trading, what does skip Schumacher, what do you think the type of player he might want to bring into the team? Do you think it will have any influence if at all? No. I just want to point out, I agree that not really, but I do want to point out that because he is so recently removed from playing, there's a lot of guys that are still active right now who were teammates of him when he was a player oh, yeah. with those teams. You'd be surprised by some of the names. Let me pull it up real quick. Just Adam Wainwright's got an article on it. Well, Adam Wainwright, he's officially off the table because he's going back to the Cardinals, right. but he's still around. Uh, the ones that I point out that might be uh, just kind of interesting from either of the teams he's been with, Matt Carpenter had a nice resurgence oh. this year with the Yankees. He's a free agent again. He was hitting bombs whenever he was healthy. Uh, he's late in his career, but has had a ton of success, and they knew each other pretty well for several years at the Cardinals. When he was with the Reds, he crossed paths with Johnny Cueto, with Anthony Desclafani, former Marlin, with Adam Duvall. With Adam Duvall, when he was coming up with the Reds, and Duvall, uh, we, you know, he's going to probably be a free agent again coming off a lost year. And we know what he brings in several departments. Um, Kennelly Jansen with the Dodgers. He's he had a he's going to be a free agent again. He was only with the Braves for a single season, so he's back on the market. And probably the one, just one player that I feel might be most attainable in that category, who I didn't even remember was a Cardinal, is Adam Ottavino. He's now he's been a reliever for a bunch of years. Oh, zero with with the yes with the uniform number zero. Originally, he was a Cardinals prospect. He came up with them like in 2010, and he pitched very well at the Mets this past year. He has a lot of swing and miss to his game and a very long track record of being a good setup reliever and an occasional closer. He'll be a free agent again. So the, I'll just throw that out there, that he does have somewhat of a different perspective on players that are available because he actually was in the clubhouse with them day to day. Uh, and so that article is up on, on fishstripes.com if you want to look at all the names in there. So when am I getting out of Vino on Water Relief? Do we book that? He would be a good guest from what I've heard. He really does. Yeah. Uh, he's good with the media. Um, um, I think, hold on. I want to ask you do... guys really quick. You guys mentioned um, supporting staff, the coaching staff for Skip Schumacher. I don't know if I saw a name on Twitter rooming around or just, you know, just looking at it. Mark McGuire retired from coaching a couple of years ago. You know, despite everything, I, I, I don't even know what to even say about Mark McGuire. Notorious. I guess that's the word to use it. Um, Eli, I would love to get your opinion on McGuire coming in for the Marlins, if that's even a remote thought. He has a lot of is close with Schumacher uh, on a variety of levels because he I don't think their playing career is intersected, but he was around the Cardinals organization uh, after he retired. And then he started his major league coaching career with them. So he, he was a coach on teams with Schumacher for several years. I think that's how they got to know each other 
best. The last time he was active in coaching was like 2018, and then he stepped aside. He wasn't fired, but he left his job with the Padres to uh, spend time with his kids because I think both of his sons were big-time high school prospects. And now I think he's an empty nester. I think one of them went on to college. The other one just got drafted and is playing in pro ball. And that made that brings up an interesting point about whether him, he's right around, I think he's Mattingly's age, like right around 60. So that's not an age that really disqualifies you from being a full-time major league coach in some capacity. And this could be like the perfect opportunity for him to come back in. And it would presumably be as the bench coach, the number two in command. Um, and I'm, that's kind of a interesting fit. Who was it that brought it up about? Um, the, well, yeah, well, Christina Nicola mentioned it on Twitter. But um, as Anthony mentioned here, like if you're going to have this newbie as a manager, ideally the bench coach would be a guy that has been an MLB manager before. And McGuire never reached that level. You know, he was a hitting coach and he was a bench coach with the Cardinals and with the Padres, but he doesn't know what it's like to fill in for more than a couple of days at a time and actually lead the team. So in that respect, you know, um, I don't think it's an ideal, it's not the way you would draw it up, even if the chemistry between them would probably be uh, be really sharp and a big advantage. But that, that's named that I can understand why he's a candidate. I don't think his, his steroid use would disqualify him from getting a job when he's already worked with these other organizations and had um, by all accounts, you know, been very serious about his job and like been really focused on being a good coach in that capacity. So that's one name, just one name out there. Uh, and, and as we imagine, uh, most positions are going to be new guys, you know, a uh, vast majority of the current coaches under Mattingly are going to be finding work elsewhere as Schumacher brings in people that he's more closely familiar with. Uh, I have a proposal, one name that hasn't really been mentioned as a bench coach or a hitting coach. Oh, what about Don Mattingly? Huh? Oh, huh? No? I thought All right, we, we have uh, Kevin Bahal joining us. Kevin, we talked about Skip Schumacher. Mike, uh, excuse me, Mark McGuire. Um, we're going to go talk about the playoffs later, but give me your quick analysis of uh, Mr. Skip as a skip. I like it. I, I wanted a spot, but I do not hate this hiring at all. Huge fan of it. He could, he's someone who could relate to these guys who are playing right now. He was also, I believe, a part of the StatCast era. So another very big pro he has there on his end. So love, love the hire and wishing and can't wait to meet him in uh, spring training. And do you, do you guys all agree for pitching coach Mel Sotomayor Jr.? That's the, that's the consensus in the room? Please. Just give him a blank check. Did, how, what, maybe if you guys could give me, what's the percentage that Mel stays – with the Marlins, is it high up there? Is it is it over fifty percent? Seventy three. I was going to say seventy six percent. Okay, eighty percent. Ooh, Eli, I need the Eli percentage. Those aren't publicized. We don't publicize the Eli percentages. <laughs> I'll go ninety. Oh, thank God! And I'll throw two sevens in for good luck. <laughs> Um, j just with that, um, is there, you know, with Skip, is that looking, you know, maybe more towards the future is, is how do you think the future will look like with Skip Schumacher in terms, you know, you mentioned the other guys, Espada, Quartaro, just how, how does he maybe impact the future with the younger guys? Do, do you think he'll, he'll lean more into maybe what the younger guys are doing, um, developing them compared to maybe the older guys in the clubhouse? Whoa. I didn't. I'm not saying in terms because he's a young manager, and not. I don't old. know. I, I, I'll I go don't think I, that'll I don't have know. that that factors in. I don't think that's right. So honestly, so one you'd thing have to I want to bring one thing I want to bring up is that there is kind of this misconception that the Marlins are a young team, and that's not really true. Yeah. Like last year, the, what did they do last year? They signed Soler. They signed Avi Garcia. They trade for Stallings. They trade for Wendell. All in their 30s and they're all very likely going to be on this team ne next year. Like that's a big chunk of your lineup that is r relatively old by baseball standards. Um, the bullpen, the bullpen was one of the oldest bullpens in the league. Yeah, this year. There. That's been my big frustration is that they have all this young pitching that they're developing. And um, what I feel was a big missed opportunity this last off season is that they didn't really transition any of those guys into being effective relievers. It's going from starters minor league starters to major league relievers. And that leads them leaning on um, some 
players that did perform relatively well this last year, like Floro, Dylan Floro was good. Um, and others who were, I guess not all of them were good. Cole Solser was kind of a disappointment. Tanner Scott was very, Tanner Scott was very inconsistent, occasionally awesome, occasionally um, the opposite of awesome. And so they're like, there's like a lot of aspects of the team aside from the rotation are, um, are not, not young. So th- this is a team where I don't think you're look you're focusing on that when they were making this higher. Um, it's really just the rotation. Uh, that you still, you know, at that stage of their career uh, where they can still doing major league developments where it's still like an extension of their prospect stage, I guess. Uh, and it's it's not just on him. Um, as we've been mentioning, the, the issue before wasn't only Mattingly himself, you know, it was Mattingly and his entire staff. You know, it just felt like on a number of levels, this team was not well coached last year. They were just players... Uh, not just there was bottom line performance and there were just a lot of bad habits, a lot of bad situational play, a lack of adjustments. So I, I feel like in the aggregate, you know, the total contributions of the coaches under skip are going to be just as important, probably more important than skip himself. And that's why I'm very much looking forward to exactly how they fill that out. A name Anthony's mentioning here is John Gibbons for bench coaches was someone that they did um, interview for the managerial position. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Eli, and the panel. I wouldn't be opposed to it. Yeah. I think that is that's a good idea for somebody that we know clearly is interested in getting back into managing. It's not that far removed from it and yeah, has that experience. So I don't I'm not aware of any specific connection between Schumacher and Gibbons. Um so that's that's a complicated part of this is that I think they are given skip, you know a lot of latitude to pick out his new coaches. So you would think in a lot of circumstances, it's going to be ones that he's already familiar with. Um, yeah. I'm a big proponent of chemistry. We going back to the McGuire thing. Like it's, you know, it's like, is it going to be, is it going to hit or is it going to be Barry Bonds 2.0? Um, but I'm a big, big, big proponent of chemistry. Uh, just having coaches around that you're consistently on the same page. It's a lot easier to get your, message through and it comes off effortlessly um i'd i'd be a little little scared of bringing in somebody that's like you don't you've never worked with especially with him not being a uh not having a prior managerial experience outside of you know here recently uh and then bringing in a guy like john gibbons who may it get overstep a little bit in wanting to get back to being a major league manager and like, hey, well, I did this like this. And, you know, th- there's always that concern that, that something like that may uh, may play itself out during the season. Maybe things aren't going right. All of a sudden, he's just, just trying to be a little bit more forceful. You know, that that's kind of where my head goes there. I'd, I'd rather see Skip bringing his guys, knowing that, you know, at that level, you know, Guys know what they know. Noah, I'd love to hear your rebuttal on, on that. I don't have a rebuttal. He's he's right. You, I when the the that's the main reason I don't think that it should be a a someone that's managed previously because then that blurs the line between who's in charge, and that's that never I, ends well. Um, I don't know about that. Well, it, it like he said, if 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 the bench coach is a is a seasoned manager and doesn't agree with a decision that's that the manager is making and sows the seed of doubt that causes the manager to make a decision that he doesn't want to make and it doesn't end well, that reflects badly on the manager and the bench coach doesn't bear any responsibility because it was the manager's decision that he affected. Right. Well, it's more about the premise being that there are things as a new manager that you might not know how to do, or you might be making a mistake without actually being aware of it. And to have somebody that's been through it um, to be able to point out things that to make tips, like give yeah. advice from experience yeah. that skip just it, does not it, have. It, um, yeah, it, and I, that's two why sides I'm curious. Of the, of the, there's pros and cons to, to, to both. There are, but you'd be surprised as to how many decisions are when 
this is like embarrassing, but when I was ball boy in 2013, you don't know how many times that manager asks his bench coach for even the pitching coach. They ask him a myriad of times. So that one game that I was able to be a ball boy in the dugout, almost every single decision is like, hey, Rob, you think like every single one. So it's good to have uh, definitely. Obviously, Rob Leary, I don't think, had any managerial experience when he was uh, Mike Redman's bench coach, but it definitely would behoove. Uh, skip schumacher to have someone that's had some sort of yeah I, I agree with i think but i think he just glossed over the most important part of that whole statement you were you were a yeah, ball boy yeah, yeah you, know, you can't get you like, can't how could we never heard about this yeah, over you're that revealing this now this is how long have we known you isaac all right guys. years oh. and yeah you haven't told us this this is forget oh. skip schumacher i want to hear this news. i was 14 let's go back to the discussion at hand do you remember the game Yes, it was a Jeff Mathis walk-off grand slam on my birthday. Ooh. Oh, wow. Wow. It was. It was that great in top days yeah. of your life. Massive. It was a hell of a game. All I know, one thing I'll say is that when, you know, when John Carlos Stan is playing, you don't want to be anywhere near him when he comes back to the dugout, whether it was a hit or an out. You don't want to be anywhere near John Carlos. And Mike Redman was asking Rob Leary, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> no. From the ball Kevin, boy days. name the players, Kevin. Name this the players. Guy, That's Rodriguez Justin Ruggiano and Rick. No, who's – no. I don't know the guy on the right. I forgot. All right, we need John Rodriguez for that. Um. Yes, that was a ball boy era. I was wearing my prep T-shirt. That was, <laughs> that was a fun day. It was a fun day. It was a walk-off grand slam while they were celebrating at a clean-up the on-deck circle, you know, materials. It was what a, is it was Justin a Ruggiano day. doing nowadays? That's what I want to know. Justin Ruggiano is a guy. Being angry on Twitter. Oh, yeah. He's a bit <laughs> of a weirdo on Twitter nowadays. I forgot. <laughs> How do we put this? Well, okay. cool. That's going to be my new profile picture. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I have like a gallery of Isaac pics that you sent, Isaac. You uh, know, no. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't like find them against my will. I didn't ask for them. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> Lewis's job. I mean, you found that pretty quickly. That is his <laughs> job. I agree with Lamar here. W yeah. throwback, Isaac W. Yeah, right. Ruggiano well, retired, and I just, I just wanted to give the audience a visual <laughs> reference. We have a good audience here, so thank you everybody for showing yeah. up. Um, as everybody, I don't know if you guys are ready, hoped. but um, you, you mentioned W's, and there were two teams that took W's over the course of the last couple days, and uh, one of them is in our division. So I think we do have to talk about both teams. Mm -hmm. The Phillies, the Astros, one team over 100 wins, the other one 87. The second largest win differential in MLB history is going wow. down on Friday. My Kevin, God. if you're not lagging, I would love to hear your input on the Phillies and how they got to the World Series. The Phillies are a team that was a very big benefit of the extra wild card spot because that is how they got in the playoffs, and that just shows how that just shows how getting hot at the right time works because they beat a really good Cardinals team that was led by Adam Wainwright, Albert Pujols, Yadi Molina. And then you go out there and beat the Braves. That was the most impressive series, especially three to one. You maybe would have expected it to be the other way around the Braves taking that one. But man, the Philly fought. You have Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, one of the best one two punches in the, all of baseball, just going out there and doing what they have to do. And then you beat the Padres. And now, Let's see what they could do over here at Minute Maid Park. I believe on Friday it is that they start the first game. Mm -hmm. And, um, man, Bryce Harper, Kyle Schwarber, Reese Hoskins, all in Minute Maid Park, just hitting bombs out there to the Crawford boxes or wherever it's going to go. That's going to be fun to watch. So I do believe this will be a very, very competitive <laughs> series. I don't know how many games. I would say maybe six. And that See, hold your prediction. Hold your prediction. Oh, okay. And if you guys want to watch, I think the craziest game there is going to be that third game, Halloween night in Philly, game three of the World Series. Oh, Something's going to happen there. I, I can yeah. already tell. Um, sure George, you, you put up your hands immediately when I said the World Series, the Houston Astros, the Phillies. I, I got to hear. I got to hear that why the hands were raised. I detest the Phillies. I like uh, it makes me sick. And then the whole little like I between them and the Mets, like I just there's not two teams in the majors that I detest more. Uh, and then the whole thing with like Marlins social media with the whole like that, uh, it just it drove me insane. You mean to tell me you weren't cheering for our NL East besties? JT, we got to throw JT some love. 
you know, I think if you're a Marlins fan, which I, you are, I think you should be rooting. I, for Atlanta, I'm, I hate Atlanta with a passion. But, you know, you root for yeah. your NL to do well and sort of like takes the pressure off you a little bit. If you look at the last three years, there's been an NL East team in the World Series in 2019, 2021, this year again. So it sort of, sort of solidifies that this division is probably one of the best in all of baseball if it wasn't already clear. So I thought – it's cool if the NLEs keeps winning World Series, so that's okay. It's Miami. And if you go by that guy on Twitter, Miami Marlins are supposed to be the World Series champs in 2028. So hopefully, mm-hmm. everything goes you know, right around friend. there. Um, I, Grant, I will say it. it oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I will say it. Ha- seeing a team that you had some painful losses to, some heartbreaking losses to, do that in po- in the postseason. Kind of makes your losses feel a little bit better because you see that, okay, there wasn't much stopping th- this team. This team mm-hmm. was, this team is, is, by the way, the Phillies are a fun team to watch. They're very fun. They and are. they seem to always find a way to win. And when they find a way to win, someone's got to be on the losing side. And sometimes it's us. Yeah. It's also crazy to and think about that. Um, that had we not, you know, taken care of business against the Brewers, maybe they wouldn't be here because that played a key, key component. I mean, a week the out, Marlins should be getting I, a I share the, in the World Series. The Phillies were, yeah, at least the team. I mean, like a week out, the Phillies were <laughs> like a game out, like, but they're on the outside looking in. And here they are a month later. We're about to watch them in the World Series, biggest stage of baseball. Yeah, you know what? I, I think, think, I think something that Kevin didn't mention about the Phillies is how good their bullpen is. Um, it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, I was watching the other night, I think that last game and they had Sir Anthony Dominguez. Um, and then, um, somebody else. Yeah. Sir Anthony Dominguez is crazy. And they had Sir Anthony Dominguez and Alvarado like back to back, come out of their freaking bullpen and just pumping 100 and nobody can touch it. And then they somehow reinvigorated the career of David Robertson out of nowhere. Um, like that's, right that's second to last game. The second to last game, that was literally a bullpen game. And, yes, I know, like, Eflin pitched in that game in the last inning and everything. But, you know, most of that game was a bullpen game and won them that game. And they won the game 10-6 to six and held off the Padres, who are a very good team this year. So that bullpen does a lot for that team on top of what the, their offense is doing. That bullpen is, I think Eli said it, probably their best bullpen they've had in a very long time. So yeah. got even, to, got even a year time. or two, you could see Phillies fans on Twitter every single night during the season complain about how bad the bullpen is. I mean, 2020, all those games we played against them, those double headers, yeah. like that bullpen could not take it. And it's crazy yeah. to see how it's evolved in just one year. Yeah. Crazy. I remember we yeah, also, the ener- Marlins the energy. legend Andrew Bellotti. Yeah. And Brad Hand. And Brad Hand. Yeah. Are we okay they, with that? They, are, we okay with, are we okay with Andrew Bellotti and Brad Hand <laughs> getting um getting World Series rings this year? We should talk about they that. They employed Brandon yeah. Kinsler last year too. Yeah. yeah. Are there any uh, Marlins on the Astros so we could confirm Ryan Marlins Stanek. getting a Ryan Stanek. Ryan Stanek. Ryan, Ryan Stanek. Okay. He's All been right. really good too. He, it's it's impressive. Yeah. We went two and one against the Astros this year, right? So either yeah. way, I feel yeah. like we get some share of the World Series either way. That's and what you I'm have saying. Hector Neris, who was I'm on with the no team. on this one. Oh yeah, Hector Neris is facing his former team. He left. Uh, yeah. I will say, I, I am a little bit salty. And to to add the cherry on top is the fact that last year, um, some some people know, some don't. Like I have a lot of family in Georgia, and so I spent a lot of time in Atlanta. Uh, and last year, I was in the battery for Game Five, and the atmosphere was absolutely electric. Yeah, to the um, Phillies ballpark when it gets rocking, it gets. And then rocking. you know, and then you add World Series to it. Uh, this year, uh, just so happens I'm in Atlanta for the next two months, and I was like, "Sweet, like the Braves make it, I'll be able to like have a good time in the at the Battery, and then they get just <laughs> ran through by the Phillies of all people." So yeah, just, yeah. Uh, hopefully you enjoy the Atlanta you know, Falcons instead. Like I'm a Bucks fan, so I will. Yeah, I, yeah. I will. I'm I, definitely cheering for you guys tomorrow night. Let's go. Like and, something to call out really quickly. Um, if the Astros were to win the World Series, it is a Marlins connection, not directly because this player was never on the Marlins. But Lance McCullers Jr. was very, very close with Jose Fernandez oh, from when they played yeah. in Tampa in high school. 
So that would be really cool. I remember he had his cleats with Jose on it after Jose died and everything. So there's your Marlins connection for the Astros. That's probably more important than any of the other ones for me, at least. So call that out really quick. Yeah, I was curious as to where you're going with that one. I was like, what? Thinking. Um, of- I-, I wanted to uh, bring out a-, a big point I mentioned earlier about the Phillies. And, you know, they had the lowest amount of wins in the entire playoffs across both uh, divisions, both leagues, whatever conferences. And they're going to the World Series. Do you think – what do you think that means in terms for other teams and maybe that philosophy going forward other seasons that you don't have to win 100 games, you don't have to win 110, five games to be able to go to the World Series. You can win 87, you can get under 90, make the make the wild card, and then just have a great run and make it to the World Series. What do you think that means for maybe other teams in terms of that philosophy that you don't have to win over 90, 100 games to make it? To the to World me, Series. It, to me, it means chaos, and I love it. Well, it's just, I, that's I just did what my makes best. Baseball so excellent, in my opinion, because I mean, even the worst teams win fifty some odd games in a season. All you have to do is get hot at the right time, win eighty five games, and you have a legitimate shot at the World Series. Mm-hmm. Is what I feel like this proves. Just got to get in. Yeah, you're right, Grant. Just got to get in. Yeah, I did my best when they announced that expanded playoff format to emphasize what a big deal it was for the Marlins. I mean, it's a reason why yeah, I guess in this this year it worked to their detriment in that it made them feel like deep into July that they were still in the race and they were still <laughs> within striking distance. I think a lot of people following the team day to day knew that was a farce, but statistically, because of how many spots there are available, um, it was it kind of delayed them to go into selling mode and ultimately perhaps it has something to explain for why they didn't make very many deals whatsoever at the deadline because of how relatively close they were to the final spot heading into it bigger picture if you assume the team is going to be somewhat better than we've seen recently moving forward um that they're going to be hovering around being an average team you barely have to be average to get in like you can sneak in there are going to be wacky years where a team is either around 500 or a year where maybe they get outscored by their opponents where they have a negative run differential. You could get in that way because yep. of how many, how low the bar is now for entry. It is a huge development for a team like the Marlins that is never going to put together an a hundred win team. I can almost guarantee that. Uh, and that doesn't matter anymore. This year winning a hundred games was, was, <laughs> was the kiss of death to win a hundred games uh-huh. except for the Astros, but the other teams that did, so that's no longer a anything to really aspire to, um, and that doesn't matter anymore because the bar is so much lower. It is going to be huge in the future. You didn't really feel it this year, but I think as soon as next year, you're going to understand that uh, for the Marlins and for a ton of fan bases, like this is going to maintain interest in those teams deep into the season, knowing that even if you're in that final spot, that final spot counts for everything for the Phillies. Like that is yep. the Phillies making it in this year. And as far as they did, that so drastically impacts their fan, um, the fan enthusiasm and their bottom dollar, their finances are taking such a huge boost for the foreseeable future, just because of this one playoff run made possible by the rule change. Yeah. And I think it just look at the Phillies earlier in the season. You know, a big thing was just their defense. They they can't do it defensively. Bryce Harper was hurt. They fired Joe Girardi 50 games into the season. Things weren't looking well. Rob Topsy comes in and just completely changes that organization um, in the clubhouse to the point where now they have a chance or might win the World Series. And I, I feel that's just something incredible what the Phillies did there. Because I remember we had Alex Carr on and we, you know, I think we were all talking about how the Phillies just might not have it. They just fired George Girardi. I think all of us had the Phillies sweep the uh, Marlins sweep the, the uh, Phillies. Excuse me. And I feel like it's just crazy to even think about how much turmoil the Phillies had throughout the season to get to the point where they're at now. And, and do you think also going back, maybe defense? You don't really have to have a great defense to make it to the playoffs, make it to the World Series, because. I allow the big point for the Phillies, and, and now they're in the World Series. Yeah, I mean, four games out. Yeah, that's a good point. You had Bryce Harper, who they thought would be their right fielder every single day. He goes down with an injury; he can't play the field anymore. And you have Nick Castellanos and Kyle Schwarber playing your corners. Granted, it's at Citizens Bank Park, not that difficult to play the corners, but still, you had some big liabilities in the corner outfield spots. So, you know, I think that does prove something. It maybe gives Miami a little bit of hope. You know, you have Avi Garcia and right, and we know he'll play left field next year for Miami. You assume Solaire's going to play DH, so it's a, it's a decent point. Yeah. 
one thing to go into about that, maybe something that you probably knew internally but might not have been top of mind, is that there are more strikeouts than ever in baseball, especially in the postseason. Like the numbers are way out of whack in the postseason in terms of strikeouts. And because of that, there are fewer balls in play. So defense is just by default less important if there are more strikeouts, more home runs, and less of everything else. Like there are fewer opportunities to screw up if you're the Phillies. In their opportunities they've had, we've seen some pretty ugly screw ups from them, and they've been able to overcome them just because there just are not as many of them as even during the regular season, and especially compared to previous years. If we're in this time where strikeouts are so prevalent, it's defense just is, it's frankly just not as impactful on the outcome of a game as it was just a few years ago, just as when we were watching baseball prior to this, just because of the trend that that strikeout rate is going. So I'm curious to see what that looks like next year. Obviously shifts are being restricted moving forward into next season yeah. and also the pitch clock. And we'll see all the unintended consequences yeah, that, that the pitch clock has with guys. Um, you would think not throwing quite as hard if they have less time to recover physically between pitches. Uh, in the meantime, this is just the perfect storm for the Phillies. So you can understand the more you look into it, the more it's like not that shocking that the Phillies pulled this off just because of the way the roster was constructed, the kind of upside that their star players have, and also just because of the way the style that baseball is being played right now. Because Eli mentioned rule changes, and I don't want to go backwards because I know we're talking about playoffs, but just to bring up a quick point, I think that's something that Schumacher can do that, is a plus when it comes to inexperience because he does not have to get used to, okay, we had the shift and now we don't. So how do I navigate that? Cause he doesn't have that. He never had it. Like he never had to manage that way. Right. So I think his inexperience in regards to rule changes, cause this is all he's ever going to know as a manager. I think that'll actually benefit him rather than be a detriment. Whereas it could be a detriment for some more uh, seasoned managers. So I think that's actually a plus that inexperience can bring for Schumacher. I just wanted to point that out really quick. I think the biggest thing that Schumacher won't have to deal with is that nationally uh, the rules that are now there's a DH in the National League. I think that's the toughest decision yeah. the National League manager had. I, I don't know if right. that had much to do with the shift. I think but just giving cards and go out. But uh, yeah, I think the DH is a big one for Schumacher. Never have to worry about, which kind of sucks. But yeah, whatever. and Stin ditched us in order to watch Sandy's live stream on Twitch. I would too. Oh. I haven't oh. watched any of it. Is it? Any- <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I have not it's seen not, it. I want to see him play the show instead of PUBG. He only plays PUBG. We need to get him some new games. He wants to keep oh, his man. mind off of baseball. Um, you know, I, I he can play two K. Really <laughs> I want to go really. We were talking about the Phillies. Uh, I think we have to talk about their opponent, the Astros, and just Phillies. how hot they are. You mentioned the Phillies being hot. The Astros undefeated in the playoffs. Just one of the hottest teams. Almost one of the most complete teams. In all of baseball, pitching Verlander, despite the age, is still you know, he's going to be the runaway Cy Young in the AL. They get rid of Carlos Correa. Jeremy Pena steps up and looks like not might be is going to be the starting shortstop for the foreseeable future for the Astros. Boy, say Altuve still going strong. Uh, just a whole bunch of guys there still at high level. And at top of it, Dusty Baker finally at the World Series. To me, I feel like this is two teams of destiny going at it in the world series. You have dusty Baker finally making a world series. You have the Phillies, you know, we had that comment there, nine DH lineup planned in May and now they're in the postseason. Just what do you guys think first off of the Astros and just how they've looked because you don't go undefeated in the postseason. If you're a mediocre an average team, something has to click there to go undefeated. You haven't even mentioned uh, Jordan Alvarez. Thank you. Probably the most. Wait, 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 no, Dusty's, just, Dusty's made the World Series twice. I think as a manager, I think he did it once with Giants, and then he did it last year. Obviously, he hasn't not won one yet. Yeah. All right. Yeah, but Jordan Alvarez just he is sort of slow. Yanked slow down. The, the yanked the the entire life out of the Mariners, and then the who did they play? He slowed uh, in that series against the, um, the yeah, Yankees. Yeah. Against the Yankees, he slowed down, but yeah. he absolutely yanked the life out of the, the Mariners. Could, and just set the tone for them. Yeah. Can we call this Astros team a dynasty or tarnished dynasty? Like, this is one of the best, especially specifically this year, this 2022 team is one of the best teams I've ever seen. I think besides the Dodgers, the regular season Dodgers anyway, this is the best team in Major League Baseball. I can't believe the Miami took two out of three in Houston. 
but it, it's that always a shame, you know. Is, is this one of the best teams, the best cores they've ever of any baseball team ever? Or do you have to put an asterisk next to them? You haven't seen a team like this since the Giants uh, in the early 2010s. I mean, the I Yankees, the or... of a dynasty is uh, right. like sustained success. Yeah. I would definitely say that this Astro team's a dynasty, whether they win it or not, is here. I mean, it's so hard for turnover every single year in baseball. There's so much parity in baseball. It's better than all the other sports, in my opinion, in that aspect. And here are the Astros. I think they made the ALCS at least every single year since 2017. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's crazy. That's an insane yeah. stat. I mean, whether they win it or not this year, I would say that this is a, a dynasty, a team that used to be a bottom feeder in the 16 men all central 10 years later <laughs> is now a force to be reckoned with every single year, yeah. October, November. Yeah, yeah, what I'll say is that there will be a whole lot of historical significance if they sweep the Phillies and if they sweep the entire postseason, which is what they're on pace to do right now. You know, they haven't lost yet. That is something that has not been done during this wild card era to go wow. three rounds deep and not lose a game. And that would certainly strengthen their claim. Uh, I don't know if you want to, the word dynasty could be twisted a lot of different ways. But what I'll say is that I think this would. Winning a championship period, I think, would kind of leap them over the Dodgers in terms of being like the defining team of this period of time. You know, the Dodgers are the team with an even longer playoff drought, with I think even a better overall record over the last handful of years. But the postseason success that the Astros have had is what definitely separates them. You know, the Dodgers have in a few years gone out even before reaching the championship series. And for the Astros to do this six straight years, making it at least to the CS, and now four out of six years making it to the World Series, that is extremely rare in recent history. So, yeah, to me, the the big potential, the way that this could be like on another level in terms of their historical uh, mark is if they actually sweep the series. But that also be that would suck for the audience. I mean, we want we want to see a long series and we want to see it really competitive. So I don't think it will be a sweep. It's just the fact that that's on the table, I find, yeah. is, is fascinating. That's something I'm going to be keeping an eye on. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's just a more... testament to focus. Sorry, Kevin. I think it's just a testament of focus, too, for that that span that you mentioned, Eli. Um, you know, they had all the controversy with, with, with cheating and scandals and everything else. And they had Dusty come in. And, you know, they've had a bit of turnover. Not much, but they've had a bit. They've continued to be able to. Um, to develop their prospects from within as well as add on on top of it. You know, you got unsung heroes coming through in big spots like Chaz McCormick, just literally out of nowhere, destroying the Yankees like crazy. Like (laughs) we saw that coming, like nobody. Um, So yeah, man, um, it's a team that does it well. They build from within and what they don't have, they get. And they, they mix and match very, very well in terms of what they do in terms of how they build these winning teams. So um, it's impressive. It really is that this is even possible that we're talking about the possibility that a team is going to go undefeated in the playoffs. Like that's, that's crazy. And I don't think something that we can say very often. So it's a great team. Um, I know I mentioned <laughs> McCullers before, but they also have a led Miss Diaz, which is your other connection to Jose Fernandez. So it, it would be, it would be cool um, from that standpoint, from a Marlins connection, but it would just be cool to see, you know, their focus and determination pay off. And I, I not to get to my prediction, but I think it will. So um, that's where I'm at. It's cool, though. Yeah, and the only other thing I wanted to mention was just the ma- those pitching matchups. Houston has some nice pitching. It's some some of the best in all of baseball. You have Verlander follow. I believe Framber's in the second one, and then you have Luis Garcia, Christian Javier. I really don't know if Philadelphia will be able to compete in the back end of the series against those guys because you what do you have? Bailey Falter, who was taken out in the first inning his last start. And Ranger? Ranger, Ranger Suarez is he's solid. But besides that, you have Zach Wheeler and Aaron Nola, your one-two punch, and you're probably going to have to use those guys on short rest at, what, at some Undergarden. point if you're, if you're, and you're in an elimination game. And, yeah, I, I really just love Put Houston. some respect pitching. on Noah Syndergaard's name. Wait, oh, this Noah Syndergaard's name. How's the positive? No. Wait, would you say this? I think Framber has performed better than Verlander in the postseason, and then Nola and Wheeler have both performed better than either of those pitchers on the Astros, correct? I think Nola and Wheeler have been better postseason performers than anyone on the Astros. <laughs> Or is I, that well, I, I think you'd have to say Wheeler has been the most valuable pitcher overall uh, yeah. because even Nola had that nightmare ending against the Padres. Um, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I think Wheeler is kind of three for three in quality starts. And he was looking, starts. yeah. And then a couple of those, well, one of those was especially dominant. I think the one where he went like seven scoreless um, to begin the Padres series. Yeah. And so clinching that series also, he was pretty dominant as well. 
after yeah. that start, Mr. Lewis said that he was better than Sandy Alcantara. Oh, yeah. I don't know how I feel about that one. Yeah. Is that what he said, Lewis? Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he, he said really, that Zach yeah. Wheeler is better than Sandy Alcantara. I, I think right. I compared we'll, have, we'll have Lewis on here actually for that. Yeah, I think I compared the two because they're very similar pitchers, honestly, at the beginning of last year, but I wouldn't go ahead and say that he's better. I would love to see Sandy in the postseason. I was mentioning this to someone. Like, imagine him coming out like out of the bullpen at the day after starting a game. He I mean, technically he has pitched in the postseason, but right, whether yeah. it's Mickey no. Mouse or not. No, you know what it is. <laughs> like, not pitching game hey, one. Hey, hey. The bullpin game three is like he's just a horse <clears throat> machine. That was hopefully one day we'll see it. Me too. Yeah. Hopefully in Miami. Yeah. We'll get 20,000 fans. We'll play the Mets and 20,000 of the 40,000 there will uh, be in the orange and blue. So if you want to hear um, Sandy's stats in the postseason, he's one for one. A four two six ERA in twelve point two innings. That's who? I'm sorry? Sandy. In the postseason? Yeah. Yeah. And four, Did he start not... game one against Atlanta? Or was... No, he had two starters against Cubs starting in Atlanta. Atlanta. No, he, he started game two, starts. right? He had two starts. Six of started game two, I thought. Six though was the closeout game, out game for the club. It was Cubs. Sandy six. Well, no, I'm not talking about the Cubs. I'm talking I'm talking about Atlanta. I know when Atlanta, and, uh, it was Sandy, Pablo, Sixto, and then Trevor cleaned up game three. Okay. Yeah. yeah Sandy I was, got destroyed. I couldn't remember yeah, Atlanta. Atlanta game. Sandy didn't get destroyed. He hit Acuna, like, who knows, and then they sort of – he didn't get destroyed. That, that started looking worse. I mean, we were up 4 nothing in that game, and then momentum shifted yeah, off. Yeah, I remember. The, when they were up 3 nothing on the Braves in game one, of the, I was – I drove my dad. <laughs> Dude, I was, I was like, Rojas oh, hit right. that home run to Let's the tracks, and I, I screamed in class. Yeah. There it is. Five earned runs, one home run. Sandy, right. Sandy had a great start against the Cubs. Everyone did. Him and six of both started great against the Cubs. And then all everybody ran it, except Pablo. Pablo only gave up two earned runs against Atlanta, if I'm not mistaken. And, yeah, everyone just ran into trouble against Atlanta that series. Yeah. But it, six, though, taking you, Darvish, toe-to-toe, though. What a game. No, six, though, what anyone could have. All right, Eli, I think it's that time of the show, please. This is prediction time. It's 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 time. So with this, this is the special World Series edition of predictions, not gonna count for our regular season, just for funsies. See who can uh, who can give it, predict the World Series better. For for this, it's gonna be wins the World Series, how many games, and then give me your World Series MVP. Who is gonna be the World Series MVP? Kevin, you were the last one in. I want you to hit lead off. All righty. We're going to go Astros in six. Oh, we're here. And the MVP will be Jordan Alvarez, but I wouldn't be surprised if Philadelphia could take this in seven. Great. Right. Thanks, Kevin. Alex. Of course. Um, yeah, I'll agree with Kevin and say Astros win it in six. Um, and that um, – no, let's, uh, let's go with Kyle Tucker. For your World Series Ooh. MVP, there you go. Okay. I like that. Plant High School baby, Plant Mr. High Grant, school. Mr. Grant making his. He, these two took return. my predictions. All right, all right. These two took my predictions. I'm gonna add a little bit of spice at the end of mine. I am going to go Astros and six. I think they'll win it that Friday, and it will be Jordan Alvarez as your MVP. But the night before, there's another sporting event in Houston. I'm saying oh Texas God. upset oh the Eagles God. that night. <laughs> Texas upset the Eagles on Thursday night football to give Houston quite the week. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Berger. Um, I'm taking Phillies in five. Bryce Harper's the MVP. Ooh, wow. Five. They're going to win it. They're going to win it at home. All right. Okay. Mr. Isaac. Okay. I, I think the Philadelphia Phillies will win it in six games. I The Astros are the better team, but I don't see this Philly team losing a series. So I think they can win the World Series. The NL East train will keep riding, and Zach Wheeler will be the World Series MVP. <laughs> Our fearless leader. Fearless. Our I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give the worst possible pick. The Astros sweep in four games uh, with uh, MVP Yuli Gurriel, who's getting whoa, hot at the right time whoa, after a very good regular season. Yeah. All right, yours truly, 2022 reigning champ of prediction. <laughs> so you know this one's already gonna be set in stone. I have Astros in five. MVP Jeremy Pena. 
dominating in the ALCS. I think he'll hit another two, three run homer in, in this series and be named MVP. So Jeremy Pena, Astros in five. You keep doing lastly, this, man. You keep lastly, skipping. Me. Okay, I, I, didn't, I didn't forget. I didn't forget. Why? Okay. I gotta leave the guest for last. You gotta leave the guest for last. The add suspense. You gotta add suspense. I cannot That's forget. Right. That was the punishment for beating me in the <laughs> Twitter. That was it. That was it. Those are so fun. Uh, nothing to do with my distaste for the Phillies, uh, but I'm gonna go. Sweep, uh, Astro sweep, and uh, give me Jose Altuve as the uh, MVP. Boo. Boo. You think he be, he's going to touch his chest again when he comes out? He's going to tell him not to rip off the jersey? He's going to have a, he's gonna have a, uh, a T-shirt under it this time. All right. And with that, this is our Marlins skip Schumacher playoff uh, offseason fist traps live. For Daniel, for Noah, Isaac, Eli, Grant, Kevin, Alex, George, for everyone, Lewis, all those people. This is Fish Traps Live. Always, even in the off season, go fish. We gotta end it off right. We gotta- <laughs>